This is very exciting for me. Billy D. Williams sitting across from me. Billy, thanks for being here. Well, thank you for having me. Billy D. has programmed a, a couple of movies uh, tonight. One he has loved for a long time, Public Enemy with James Cagney. You love gangster films. And then a little later, we'll have you and James Caan and Brian song. First of all, just tell me about your relationship with movies growing up, like how movies were really important to you. Yeah, the old gangster movies, are yeah. you okay with Cagney? Absolutely spectacular. As people will see here in The Public Enemy, that there was something in Cagney's eyes. I mean, he could be charming or menacing without saying a word. The way that the movies were structured, the thing I always remember uh, was that they always had a ma, or they had some somebody who loved them. Yeah. <laughs> No well, matter in, what they did. And, you know, in White Heat, Cagney's ma is, is part of his gang, right? But here, his ma loves him, but she's totally it's, oblivious yeah, to the sweet fact old lady. that her son is a, that one of her sons is a, <laughs> uh, is a thug. Uh, who who turned you on to these movies? I don't know. When you're a kid, you know, these are the movies that were shown yeah. at, the, that, that, at that time. But that said, your folks did like movies, right? They oh, were, yeah, my mom especially pirate movies. You know, doing Lando, The Cape. I was thinking of uh, Errol Flynn. Yeah, <laughs> right, and you see that. You'd always wanted to play those kind of roles, yeah. right? And my mom used to love uh, Rudolph Valentino. So when I was a kid, I said, I, I, that's what I want to be. I want to be Rudolph Valentino. So like a romantic leading yeah, man. Yeah, ro romantic le leading man. I would say mission accomplished uh, on that. <laughs> well done. What was special about that generation of actors. I mean, it was the uh, golden age of movies, yeah. obviously. And they were personalities. That's what people were buying. They were buying good acting, but they were really buying personalities. And the, we're about to see uh, James Cagney in the, in, in the Public Enemy. The same thing. I mean, he's playing this hoodlum, this really bad guy, right? You wait, you wait the whole movie for redemption. You're going to be frustrated. But there's still very much, it's Cagney, right? And, and William Wellman, who directed, like, there's a lot of really tight shots of Cagney, right? Fantastic. And uh, when he died, he died in a way that nobody else could. Uh, I mean, he was doing a dance. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we've talked about a lot of interesting things. Uh, but what we're going to do now is uh, watch The Public Enemy with James Cagney, directed by William Wellman. And uh, uh, Billy, we'll come back afterwards and talk about it. Okay, fantastic. Here it is from Warner Brothers 1931, James Cagney, The Public Enemy. I'm back with the great Billy D. Williams. Uh, Billy D., thanks for uh, sitting down here, coming on TCM. Oh, well, thank you for having me. Billy's got a new memoir out, What Have We Here? It's hard not to imagine you saying it. What have we here? <laughs> That's what you say to Princess Leia in The Empire Strikes Back. So we've just seen The, the Public Enemy. I mean, that... Uh, that last shot, that James Cagney death, is uh, that's as memorable a death as you're going to get in the oh, movie. He's one of the great dyers of all time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Cagney was uh, special. And then to know that that guy could could do Yankee Doodle Dandy, right? Well, you you almost kind of see it when he's dying. Because it's a dance. Yeah, you know, he's doing a little dance when he could. Even though his <laughs> arms and legs are tied, right? His legs fly up when he hits the ground. Put in front of that door. Yeah. In, in a kind of a mummy look, with a mummy look, it was the energy was so strong. And If you were to rank classic actors by energy, he, he might come in first. Yeah. Uh, talking about classic actors, your first movie was from 1959, The Last Angry Man. That was Paul Muni uh, from... Juarez. Uh, Juarez, Louis the, Pasteur. The original Scarface. The original Scarface. You, you connected with him. He connected with this Yeah, well, actor. he chuckled a lot about Scarface, but... What he really loved was were the uh, two, uh, the Emil Zola and uh, Louis Pasteur. The stories he was about. very proud of those movies. Yeah, and you learned a lot from him, right? Oh yeah, Luther Adler too. Well, you know, I found out that it didn't matter who you were, what you were, if you wanted to do something as an actor, you did it. You learned a lot from another classic actor. You did a play with Joan Plowright, Taste of Honey, in the '60s, right? Right. Yeah. Her boyfriend then, about to be her husband. It was Laurence Olivier. Laurence Olivier. Tell everybody what you did when you met Laurence Olivier. I didn't really know what to say to him, so I just gave him a kiss on the cheek. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And I thought he would think I was totally outrageous, but he uh, he chuckled about it. He liked you. Yeah. Yeah, and you guys yeah, talked. We used to have great, great conversations. I asked him about playing Othello once. And, and he, uh, at this point, he hadn't done it. He had been thinking about it. But he always uh, had uh, 
the uh, Paul Robeson who originally did it. Paul Robeson was the actor forever identified yeah. with, with the fellow, yeah. The stature and the voice of Robeson was what was in, impressive to him in terms of uh, portraying that character. So he, I think when he decided to do it, he got a vocal coach and he trained his voice to be uh, deeper. I just find that interesting because I, you wrote about it, but because, you know, he got so much criticism for that. The blackface, the voice and the whole look like it was a caricature. But you thought it was so fantastic. It was so outrageous. If you're going to do something, you know, do something that's original, first of all. Right. And uh, but do something that not everybody is going to fall in love with. And you liked it was big. You liked that. Yeah. You liked the, the yeah. idea. He was yeah. a maverick. He was a maverick. He was he was a much more, very physical kind of actor anyway. Yeah. As opposed to let let's say like uh, Gilgood, right? Uh, when they talk about the Edmund Keen school of acting, it's acting from the neck up. He was more with Olivia, his body. Olivia, it was the whole body. Yeah. Billy D, thanks so much. I enjoyed this thoroughly. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and we're not done. We got another movie to talk about. This one starring James Caan and, uh, oh yeah, Billy D. Williams. <laughs> uh, stay with us. Brian Song coming up next on TCM. Next on TCM, Brian Song. Then the bingo long traveling all stars and motor kings. And later, Scott Joplin. Jazz it up with TCM tonight. I'm here with uh, Billy D. Williams. This is a great uh, uh, thrill for me. Billy D., thanks for coming in and uh, programming these two movies tonight. Well, thank you for having me. We just had James Cagney in The Public Enemy. Uh, we move next to a critical film in your career, right? From uh, from 1971, aired first as a movie of the week on television. Brian's Song from 1971 with you and James Caan telling the true story of the relationship between Gail Sayers and Brian Piccolo teammates in the 1960s with Chicago Bears. Uh, how did this uh, project uh, uh, come your way? Lou Gossett was originally uh, cast to, to play Gail Sayers, but he was playing um, uh, basketball and uh, hurt his uh, Achilles heel. Yeah, he tore his Achilles tendon. It's a serious yeah. injury. So he was not able to do it, so they called me, and I happened to be in... I was living in New York at the, at the time, and but I had a and a, a place out here in California, and they called me in to audition for it. And my at that time, I, it, the audition worked very well. One because of it was all about uh, Brian Piccolo having cancer, and my father was dying of cancer at that time, so it, it hit a nerve. And you, you and your father were exceptionally close. You and your mother too. Yeah. You had a really close family. You had a twin sister, and the four of you were all very close. Was the audition difficult? Did you, you know, did you, you obviously you used... No, I fell, fell into it right away. And then, uh, of course, when I met Jimmy, uh, James Kahn, we had a, an immediate chemistry. Had you met him before? No, that was the first time. I mean, it is a little hard to believe yeah, that you was, guys, it seemed like you guys have been friends for 20 yeah. years. But it was meant to be that whole uh, adventure. I hadn't seen Brian's song in... I don't even know, 25, 40 years. Maybe I haven't seen it since I saw it the first time and made such an impression. Here's what I didn't remember about this movie is that it's, it's pretty funny. I mean, and tell the part where it takes its turn toward tragedy. There's a scene early in the movie, right after we meet you, you show up, you have your first conversation with James Kahn. And Kahn, as Brian Piccolo, tells you that George Hallis, the coach of the Bears, has one bad ear. And so you should always try to get on the side of his good ear. And so you go in to meet Hallis and you're constantly running around the room to get on the good side. Jack Ward constantly looking the other way and you're over there. And it's like a farce, incredibly funny. Again, it's one of those things when you think about this movie, you don't think... Oh, I'm going to laugh a lot in this movie. But you and Jack Warden there, you guys were, that was a little Laurel and Hardy business you had going on. <laughs> yeah, well, Warden was, uh, working with him was a lot of fun. He was a guy that uh, had a great sense of humor. Before we show the movie, uh, Gail Sayers uh, is based partly on his, his, his book, I Am Third. Um, and normally you're playing a guy like this. He's right there. You have a chance to meet him, talk to him, get to know the character. But he... He was, he, like you, he's sort of shy and reserved, and there was not a lot of 
You, yeah, guys we, didn't, you didn't, didn't talk all night. We didn't spend much time talking to each other, but we always spent time observing each other in sort of a furtive way. Uh, I mean, I would uh, always look to see what he was doing. I wanted to pick up certain idiosyncrasies, and uh, he would catch me, and he was watching me, but he would catch me watching him, and then he'd pr pretend that he wasn't looking at me. And uh, it was one of those kind of relationships. It was very, very interesting, I must say. Well, whatever it was, it worked. How did you do it without? But I knew him. I understood him. You understood him. I was, per I was the perfect person to portray uh, Gail. Well, I think that's uh, definitely true, as, as people are about to see. Uh, this is a rare movie, Billy D on TCM, when you are seeing it not the way the director intended, because... <laughs> there are no commercials. <laughs> and this aired in 1971 on television. Uh, here it is uh, without commercials uh, from 1971. Billy D. Williams and James Kahn in Brian's song. I'm back with uh, Billy D. Williams, who you just saw as Gail Sayers in, uh, in Brian's song. This movie changed the trajectory of your career, right? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I was nominated for uh, an Emmy. And no disrespect, Keith Mitchell won the Emmy for his portrayal of, I guess, King Henry VIII in a, in a TV movie. But, I mean, you and James Caan should have shared. No, no, absolutely. Yeah. All of a sudden, the roles changed for you, right? Because the next year, you're, you're starring opposite Diana Ross in the Barry Gordy production of Lady Sings the Blues. And he did another movie with Diana Ross a couple years later, Mahogany, right? Right, yes. And all of a sudden, you were a romantic leading man. Which, you know, earlier tonight we were talking about your mother and, uh, you know, how she loved Rudolph Valentino, right? The Rudolph Valentino movies. And you thought back then, like, I'd like to be a romantic leading man. And then, bang, you were. Well, when I saw myself walk down those stairs in La Lady Sings the Blues in a yeah. white suit, I thought, my goodness gracious. Let's get back to Brian's song. I don't want to overstate the power of a, a movie but, well, 55 million people saw it, right? And, you know, coming in 1971, this story of a, uh, more than a friendship, I mean, this, uh, you know, uh, kind of a it love affair. It made a statement. A love affair between a black man and a white man. That, yeah. that mattered to America in 1971 to see that. Yeah, it was, it was cathartic. I'm certain of it. I interviewed James Caan uh, not too long before he died, and, you know, he still says he'd go out People come up to him, talk about Brian. So how much it touched them, reached them. Uh, as much as it happened for him, I get the sense it happened even more uh, for you. Even today, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to depress you, but it's been 53 years since Brian's song, <laughs> um, and people still come up to you, right? Guys, even you know, bigots, right? Uh, come up to me and uh, really want want to tell me how much it changed at least for a moment, change their their uh, thinking and their, their life. And what is it? They didn't think they could care so much about what happened to a, to a black guy or they didn't, or they, you know, or they yeah. didn't think they could be moved by it. It was like they were being relieved of something. Yeah. You know, that's the feeling I always got. It was like, whew, I don't have to be this person. Oh, that's, well, that's pretty powerful. At least for a moment. Right, maybe it didn't last, but at least for a moment yeah. they got, yeah. Um, uh, Billy D, this has been a, a pleasure to meet you, talk to you. It was a pleasure to read your book, What Have We Here? Great stories of a very interesting, eclectic life and career in Hollywood. Thank you. Billy D is done for the night, but his movies continue here on TCM. Coming up next, the bingo long traveling all stars and motor kings with Billy D. Williams, James Earl Jones, and Richard Pryor. It's next on TCM. Next on TCM, the bingo long traveling all stars and motor kings, then Scott Joplin, and later the life and death of Colonel Blimp. Crash with TCM tonight.